Hey everyone, welcome back to another DIY Weissen build log, a series where I'm trying to create an open source version of the Dyson Light Cycle Task Light, or as it's now called, the Dyson Solar Cycle. In the last build log, my goal was to get the DIY Weissen into a stable state where I could power it up and use it all day long, and then evaluate it as a real functioning task light. To do this, I implemented a passive cooling system which cools the lamp while it's turned on and totally eliminates the risk of overheating the LED chip. Since then, I've been actually using the DIY Weissen both as a focused spotlight that illuminates a small area right on my desk, and also as a glowing ambient light that illuminates a wider area of the room off to the side. This cooling solution has worked flawlessly over the past few months, and so I've been able to learn a lot just by using the lamp day to day. First, I've learned that the light quality is just fantastic. Colors look deep and vibrant, and this lens provides just enough diffusion and softness that the shadows aren't too harsh. Sometimes the LED color can feel a bit on the warm side in this LED that I chose, which is 3500K, but at night and in low light situations, the warm tone is really nice, and because of that, I'm gonna stick with it for now. I also learned that I love the small area of illumination that this lamp creates. It's a bit different from your typical desk lamp because it's just so small that the light is inherently concentrated on a really contained area and there's very little spillover into other parts of the room. In my experience, it's really perfect for focusing on a single task right in front of you, like reading or working on something small without unnecessarily lighting up the rest of the room. And also going into this testing, I was concerned about the durability of the Super Tracks, which is what I'm using in place of a cable to power the electronics, but I found that they've actually held up really well. They're showing a little bit of wear right now, but it hasn't gotten noticeably worse over the course of my testing, and that's a really good surprise. However, despite all these good qualities, there are still two fatal problems with the project, and these are the persistent high-pitched whine of the LED driver and the light flickering that appears on camera. I've had these issues ever since I first assembled the PCB and powered up the lamp. I was kind of hoping that over time I would learn to live with them, but in reality these problems have only become more noticeable in my experience. The light flickering is less of an issue because it only appears on camera. It was suggested that I adjust my camera's shutter speed and frame rate to better align with the PWM frequency, but I would prefer to find a truly flicker-free solution that works flawlessly regardless of camera settings. At this point, you might be thinking to yourself, hey, I think I just saw the DIY Weissen just a few seconds ago on camera without any flicker at all. And you saw right, as of right now, the DIY Weissen is flicker and noise-free thanks to this a brand new LED driver which looks just about identical to the old one, but under the hood, there's a huge difference. The way our old driver controlled LED brightness is using pulse width modulation or PWM, and that basically toggles power on and off at varying durations at a high frequency and is able to achieve varying levels of perceived power output. That frequency factor is really important though and ended up being our rate limiting factor. When the frequency is too low, that toggling between off and on becomes perceptible on camera or even to the human eye. You can overcome this by cranking up the frequency, but pushing that too far is what generated our noise problem. This new driver eliminates PWM frequency completely with this pin. This is an input pin, and it's sensitive to a voltage range between 0 and 2.6 volts. It can take that reference voltage and use it to scale the output power to the LED accordingly. So say the signal on this pin is 5% of 2.6 volts, the output power will also be 5%. That's more or less how it works. The reference values are actually inverted, so a 0 volt input corresponds to 100% power output, but you get the idea. It's simple, noise and flicker free variable brightness control. The critical part of this is that because the reference voltage range is so low, we can send the full range of control signals to the driver straight from the cutie pie. It is such a relief to have these issues resolved. Over the past few months, I've actually felt pretty discouraged from working on other parts of the lamp because I've always had these two issues in the back of my mind and I never knew if I was gonna be able to overcome them. Now I feel really confident investing time into the remaining work on the lamp. So now it's just a matter of wiring up the new driver, changing the output pin on the cutie pie, and switching from PWM output to an analog output. And if you're curious how I set the LED value, it looks something like this. So I have a function here called set brightness and I can pass in a percentage between one and 100 to determine how bright I want the LED. This is the pin that outputs to the LED driver and I'm going to set it to a 16-bit value. And that value is determined by what's on this side of the equal sign over here. So uh, I start off by uh, passing in a brightness value, so that's going to be that 25%, and I mentioned before that it's actually the inverse percentage that I want, so 
when I output a full 2.6 volts, it actually sets the output brightness to zero. So anytime I feed in a percentage like this, I need to flip it so that instead of 25%, it's 75%. So I just have a little helper function here that does that. So it just returns, subtracts the value from 100 and converts 25% to 75%. It then divides that by 100 to get it to a number between zero and one. And then I use this variable here to multiply that value by the maximum 16-bit output value. And the way that I figure this out is up here where the maximum 16-bit value equates to 3.3 volts. So 3.3 volts is the maximum power output on that pin. Our maximum is actually just 2.6. So I divide 3.3 by 2.6 to get a fraction. And then I multiply this 16-bit value that equates to 3.3 volts times this fraction that I got. And I end up with 51634. And that's the equivalent of 2.6 volts. So when I multiply that by this percentage, I have my power output. And, and anytime I want to change the brightness, I can just update this and say, set the brightness to 50 and it'll do all that and set the output. Since I need to make some changes to the PCB to accommodate this new driver, I figured I would try to ride this wave of good luck I've been having and test out adding an ambient light sensor to the project so that the DIY sync can detect and respond to brightness in its environment. Adafruit has this simple light sensor breakout board that I want to use, and I'll probably add this little sensor directly to the PCB for the final version. The sensor outputs a 16-bit value between about 2000 in complete darkness all the way up to 65,535 at maximum brightness. At its most basic level, the auto brightness functionality is really just about taking these two variables, the incoming light sensor value and the existing LED output value and defining a relationship between the two of them. And I actually don't know exactly what this relationship should be yet, but to start, I know that I want to test two variants. First, a linear relationship where ambient brightness and output brightness are directly correlated and the lamp gets brighter as the room gets brighter. And I also want to test an inverse linear relationship where the model is flipped and the lamp gets darker as the room gets brighter. I'm trying to suspend my judgment on either of these solutions for now, and I'm just gonna get to work on them, give them some testing, and then go from there. Before I start working on auto brightness, I need to fix something I've been putting off for a while. The way that the brightness settings work right now is there are four brightness levels at 25% increments, where 50% brightness just means 50% of total output power. But if you look at the range of the LED output, you'll notice that many of the brightness steps are quite similar to their neighbors in terms of the perceived brightness. I want to change this so that there's a bigger jump between steps and also so that the full range is wider. And to do that, I need to change the output from a linear progression to an exponential exponential one. In these examples, I've scaled the power output using an exponential curve, which gives us a much wider brightness range, where the difference between steps is more noticeable, and it achieves a smooth and linear progression of perceived brightness. These principles also apply to the light sensor, but in reverse. So incoming light values need to be amplified at the low end and flattened out as they get closer to the maximum. So I'm going to apply a reverse exponential scale or a logarithmic scale to the incoming light sensor value. So now I can move on to actually implementing a bare bones auto brightness feature to test out. The way I'm doing this is I have this global auto brightness toggle and when it's on, I check the sensor reading every second to test whether it's in this arbitrary threshold. If the ambient brightness is outside of that threshold, I just shift the output brightness up or down to match it. I'm hoping that by spending a few days experimenting with auto brightness, the right solution will just become obvious. So I'm gonna do that and I'll let you know what I find. All right, it's been a few days, and I think I have some conclusions about how this feature should work. Going into this, I was kind of fixated on these two variables of ambient brightness and LED brightness. But what I found is there's this surprising third variable that's really important in the auto brightness equation, and that's user input. The question that kept popping into my head during testing was, what is the user signaling when they turn on the lamp, and how should that inform the auto brightness feature? When I turn on the lamp, basically what I'm saying is I want to take the entire equation of brightness in the room and add one to it. And it doesn't really matter how bright it is in the room, the contents of that equation basically stay the same. 
So thinking about it that way, I think the goal of auto brightness should be to do that, to provide just enough additional light to meaningfully augment the existing ambient light in the room. I do realize that it is an obvious point and that it could feel fairly intuitive, but I also think that there is a world where uh, you have this approach where as ambient brightness in the room increases, the output brightness of the lamp could go down just because there's more uh, total illumination in the room and I couldn't get that re that possibility out of my head So I had to try both approaches the auto brightness approach that has worked for me is the one where there's a direct Relationship between ambient brightness in the room and output brightness and using this approach I basically never use the manual adjustment buttons on the top I just let the auto brightness do its thing and it was almost always spot-on it worked really well My DIY sin is going to basically work like this But with a little bit of sophistication added on if I ever use the brightness controls on top to manually adjust the brightness, I want to do basically a soft toggle on the auto brightness and turn it off until the next time I turn the lamp on. This will just eliminate situations where I'm fighting with the auto brightness and it will tell the lamp if I ever do manual controls, just stop trying to do auto brightness. And lastly, the only way right now to toggle auto brightness is to go into the code and change the Boolean. So I want to add a way to use these controls to do the hard toggle on and off of auto brightness. For my DIY sin, I'm planning to extend the PCB length a little bit so that I can add the sensor up on top behind the control buttons. This way the sensor won't pick up any direct light from the LED, but it can still get a good reading of the ambient light in the room. I've made these changes to the PCB and also added the updated footprint and traces for the new LED driver. I also took this opportunity to beef up the traces that carry power to the board and plan to swap out some of the basic through holes with actual connectors to make the assembly a lot easier. In the next build log, I'll show you this updated PCB and I should have this whole LED housing area looking fairly finalized. A theme in this build log has been fatal flaws, and there's one more fatal flaw in the DIY sin that I'll try to fix in the next build log. It's the alignment of the pogo pins on the horizontal super track. I have some ideas for how I might fix this issue, so I'm excited to try them out and share them with you. So I'm going to go do that. That pretty much wraps it up for this build log, but join me next time where I'll have the PCB in hand, and I'll move on to addressing this problem back here. Uh, and trying to align the pogo pin. So that will feature a little bit more 3D modeling, printing, uh, stuff that's in my comfort zone. One last thing is that if you're going to open source in San Francisco this year, I'll be there. Uh, I'm not, not officially at all. I'll just be wandering around as an attendee, but if you see me, feel free to say hi. All right, that's it for this build log. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.